Welcome to Thermodynamics for Science Communicators. This is a course that is called Bionics of Surfaces in our course profile, and it's developed towards thermodynamics because we need the background to be able to explain what happens at surfaces. So at the end of the course, we'll go towards surfaces to uh, cover the material. But first of all, we need to do some basic thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is a subject that was discovered invented as an empirical subject. Empirical meaning it was, the measurements were made but they weren't based on anything. The fits were, okay we see this thing happening repeatedly therefore we will say it always happens but that was only later connected to other theories. The laws of thermodynamics are, uh, there are four of them, but they're labelled from one or from zero to three, and that's because number one to three were there first, and then the zero was added before, uh, afterwards, but before. The zeroth law just says that temperature exists. That's why I put T. Temperature exists, so if we have two things that are the same in temperature, and we take a third thing up that's also the same in temperature, we can measure them all and find that they're the same. Um, we need that to be able to define anything. What that tells us as science communicators is that the basis of thermodynamics is behind whoa, autofocus, really bad autofocus, philosophy. Ah, oh, there it is. It's going to the right place. So we have just a law, law zero, that says if things are the same temperature, that's a meaningful thing to be able to say they're not just going to change or it's not just a property of one thing. The second one says energy exists. It's the one that you will know from physics. We can't make or destroy energy um, with obviously the extra bit from Einstein that says yeah, there's something connected to mass. If we hide the energy in some other way, it changes mass. This is uh, simple-ish, but it's a very important part to say, because obviously if we can allow energy to appear or disappear, then we don't have to worry about bookkeeping. If we know that it's never going to go away, then we can follow it turning into different things, and we can count it in and count it back out again, and that means that we can predict things that will happen. Number two is about entropy, so that's the amount of disorder in a certain way, although it's described very badly very often. So we can have the amount of entropy that is in something that goes up always, but it doesn't have to go up locally. It can go down locally, so when we think, when you're learning this maybe, when you're reading something, the entropy in your brain goes down, but because it makes your head hot, the entropy in the universe goes up. And the third point is um, that if we cool things down very, very much, there is some magical temperature where something weird happens. So we can define a temperature of zero Kelvin, where if we take a gas and we cool it down, we, it would theoretically have zero volume. Obviously something weird happens at that point, and that corresponds to the point, according to the third law of thermodynamics, it corresponds to the point where if you were able to get a perfect crystal of something, where it would have as the lowest possible amount of energy, which is not necessarily zero. So let's go through these from the top. So this first one is formulated as if two things are in thermal equilibrium with each other, so you touch them to each other and no more energy transfers, then if one of them is in thermal equilibrium with a third one, then the third one and the one that we haven't chosen yet are also in equilibrium, which is just a roundabout way of saying if we take three things, or if we take two things and we measure the temperature of them and they're the same, when we bring them up close to each other, we will find 
that they are the same temperature. We need that to be able to define temperature. There are variations, but effectively we are defining that temperature is a thing that, that uh, bodies can have and that it can have different values, but uh, we can define it. That's important because otherwise we get stuck in a circle of defining the same thing or defining temperature from one of the other two variables that we're going to have. And that's always a problem. Temperature is better to have as the basic unit. The second one is energy, and in a normal formulation, or in the classical formulation that you'll have heard, is something like heat at his work. So that's, I think that's what like, my grandparents had. So if we take heat energy, which would be the energy that it takes to heat something up, we can convert that into work. And if we do that, then the amount of heat energy goes down. So the heat, the energy in our system, which could be something, a steam engine typically for this type of thing, because thermodynamics was mostly invented because of the advent of steam engines. And we plan to make them better with maths. Very strange idea, I know, but still, the plan to make them better with maths, that worked importantly and here we have a concept if we have heat energy we can convert it into work and we can convert the work energy back into heat but we can't just get rid of it something else has to happen mostly heat and work for a practical engineering type uh, reason obviously those are the things that we're mostly interested in and we are unlikely to be interested Try and refocus again. Oh. We're unlikely to be interested in esoteric things like the mass of the coal, the tiny differences in the mass of the coal, which is really where that um, energy came from. If we go to the second one, we have now a new unit, a new thing. We have to introduce entropy. Coming back a little bit, to the first law. First, uh, we should also mention that there are different types of energy, which you will have had in school, gravitational potential energy, how high something is, um, kinetic energy, how fast it's moving with a factor of its mass, the amount of energy that it has from moving, heat energy, work, and uh, other types of energy that we can define as we go along. And we can also discover from this, the other alternative formulation of this, is that certain types of perpetual energy machines are not possible. If we define that energy cannot be created or destroyed, we can also assume that this means, is a very hard uh, constraint, that we can't generate a machine that can do work without us having to apply some form of energy to it as it runs out, because it's giving out work, so it must be taking in some kind of energy. Otherwise, it will eventually run out. The second law of thermodynamics, I've forgotten where we were there, is defining, or is usually the old style, it says something about heat cannot travel on its own from a cold place to a hotter place. You can get it there, but you have to apply some kind of energy to do so. If you just leave it, it will tend to move in the other direction. This is leads on to the concept of entropy, because entropy is what we imagine is some kind of property that drives that. Fundamentally, what that tells us is something about the concept of time. It brings us all the way back to philosophy and says, OK, we now have learned something about the concept of time. The way that we know that time is going forwards is that entropy is going up, is that things that are hot, if they can connection with things that are cold, get cooler, that the heat goes in the direction of the cooler thing. That seems obvious because that's our normal understanding of things, but it is a problem in mathematics because mostly in mathematics there is no reason, there's no obviously reason why things can't be 
um, symmetrical in time. So if we take a, a physics problem, standard physics problem, you fire a cannon and the ball goes on a parabolic trajectory, so we ignore friction and all kinds of other things, the ball will go on a parabolic trajectory. There is no reason why a cannonball moving in the opposite direction wouldn't take exactly the same trajectory and land back inside the cannon. There are the um, maths that tells us which, what path our cannonball will follow is perfectly symmetrical. There's no reason why it shouldn't go the other way. So there is a problem with that that we don't know from our most types of maths which way things go. And so we need a property to force it to do that. And that this property we call entropy. And the first way of defining it is to say, yeah, if we've got some heat, it goes and spreads out. So we've got hot thing, it spreads out to become two warm things. If we have two warm things, they don't spontaneously form a hot thing and a cold thing. What is interesting is that this concept of heat going spontaneously to a cooler place leads all the way to a concept of why time has a direction, or at least a concept linked to time having a direction. We still can't imagine a good connection because we've only just generated a new concept, but we have uh, found something that we always goes in one direction. The only thing that always goes in one direction. And then we have our number three, which is that fourth law, which is the third law of thermodynamics, which says if we cool things down, they will eventually get cold enough that things might stop moving, which means that there is a zero temperature because things can't go any slower than not moving at all. If we're measuring speed rather than velocity, there is no speed below zero. We can't have a negative speed. You can have a negative velocity. That means you're going the wrong way. But we can't have a negative speed because it doesn't make any sense. Speed is a is not vector. And so if we cool down our solid, it can get slower and slower and slower, but it can't go negative in speed. And so there must be some kind of minimum temperature. In reality, it's very hard to get there. What I did forget to mention was the second type of perpetual motion machine, which is not as commonly conceived of as the first type. So the first type is we have a machine, it gives out work typically, because that's usually more useful than heat. It gives out work and it uh, takes in no energy. So that can't exist because we have to generate the energy from somewhere. The second possible problem is if we have a source of energy, but if we have a source of heat, so we're imagining it to be the original one where we have a warm thing or a hot thing, and we put it next to a cold thing, we have a flow, we can use that to generate our work, but we can only make a machine to extract that work if we have a hot thing and a cold thing. We can't just have a source of heat energy. We have to have somewhere to put the waste heat, which is why our cars have a cooler on the front, why our steam engines need cooling on the pistons typically to get them to work properly, because we need to take the heat energy out. Otherwise, we can't extract any work anymore. So now we ought to really define what temperature is, because we oops, that's okay, because we've spoken about it, but we haven't really done anything with it. So let's have a look at that. If we choose a uh, something as a model for our temperature, we can think of hydrogen molecules. So a hydrogen molecule is H2, which you should know from chemistry, but you probably don't. So it's two hydrogen atoms attached to each other by a bond. This is the way of drawing it. It's not really what it looks like. 
So we've got some hydrogen. Let's draw one the other way around because there's no reason. Let's go like that. So there's no reason why they should be in any particular orientation. What's interesting here is that the temperature is telling us something about how these are moving. So if we have a combination of hydrogens and we make them move faster, but randomly, so let's make this one move in this direction, this one move in this direction, this one move in this direction, and this one uh, over here. If we make them move in random directions, that magnitude, the average magnitude, has something to do with the temperature. How can we know this? We can know this if we change the temperature of a gas and measure the speed of sound, for example, because the speed of sound has something to do with the average speed of these molecules because we're talking, making sounds, and as the sound propagates through it, it is interacting with these molecules. So if we make it hotter, the speed of sound changes. If we make it colder, it changes in the other direction. So we know it has something to do with it. And that makes sense, because if we want to transfer sound energy from one side to the other, it has to piggyback on some of these movements somehow. If we think of Einstein and relativity, we can say if we take all of these molecules and we tell them all to move in the same direction, which would be, let's say, that way, we tell them all to move that direction, then something strange has happened. Because they're all moving across in this direction, they don't have heat anymore. Because according to them, their frame of reference is just moving very fast in this direction at about probably 300, maybe 400 meters per second in this direction, because the time during it moves really fast. That's obviously yeah, not necessarily a good thing, but it's interesting that if we manage to persuade all of the molecules to go in one direction, then their temperature changes. We can exploit this, in fact, by taking all of these molecules and letting them get hot. So having them moving in all different directions, in which case they're hot, and then letting them out through a tiny hole. The gas that goes out through the tiny hole is by definition molecules that happen to have been traveling towards the hole at the time when the hole was opened, and those have only kinetic energy in the same direction as each other. So until they hit anything, they are very, very cold indeed. They may be able to do something else, which is why I've chosen hydrogen, because hydrogen has a bond, so the bond can have some energy, and it can also rotate, so it can have this rotated down to the bottom, and this here. So what happens if we heat up hydrogen? If we heat up hydrogen, so this is, let's call, cool, let's do it differently to normal, just to see whether this works. Let's have the amount of energy. So this is the amount of energy that we put in. We're going to add and add and add energy, and this is the temperature T. Normally, when we heat up hydrogen, we add a certain amount of energy, it gets a certain amount warmer. We know this from um, normal experience with water, so I don't know whether you'll memorize that, but I did while I was at school. I memorized the heat coefficient of water. It's relatively simple because it's a definition of the joule. So if we apply energy to a to water, it gets warmer, and the amount that gets warmer is always the same as long as we keep the mass the same and the amount of energy that we add every increment. And the same is true for hydrogen, except that something weird happens. At the temperature, x, it gets flatter. And at another temperature, y, it gets flatter, it gets flatter again. 
Yeah, it's not so easy to draw this way around. We can draw the differential of this curve, which would be the specific heat capacity, the amount of heat it takes to heat up one um, gram of hydrogen by one degree centigrade, one Kelvin. And we would see that it goes up. So we have constant and it goes up. And then here it goes up again. So something weird is happening. Water behaves inside a normal region as if it's got a constant heat capacity. Hydrogen behaves as if it's got a constant heat capacity, but it has two steps where something changes. And those steps are where there is enough energy to excite one of the other things that has happened. So down here, where it gets hot quickly, all of the energy is going into motion of the molecules. In the middle here, where it's going up a little bit slower, some of the energy is also going into rotating the molecules. And when we get to here, a little bit hotter, some of the energy is also, in addition to going into rotating the molecules, is also going into vibrating the bond. What's interesting about hydrogen, or what's interesting about this, is these temperatures aren't that unattainable. You would imagine we have to cool it down to a really ridiculously low temperature to get any of these things to happen. But no, some of these temperatures, okay, this one is cold, but it's not that cold. It's reachable in fairly normal situations. So it's possible to get down to this temperature. This isn't actually that unusual a temperature. It's quite, it's not, um, so it's quite common for us to be able to have hydrogen and switch it on and off the vibration. That's a little bit weird. Because why should we be able to switch on and off the vibration just by heating it up? And the answer is quantum mechanics. The vibrations are not an infinite number of different energies that we can put in. We can't just put in any old energy. We have to put in some kind of quantity, some kind of amounts of energy, enough to make it oscillate. That isn't a thing that we are familiar with in our macroscopic world. It only happens in the microscopic world, but it's an important factor that we can see in the heat capacity or the heating properties of hydrogen. Down here, we have to cool it down so much that it can't rotate. So we can't, we don't have enough energy to change the rotational state of the hydrogen, which means that even if the hydrogens work into each other, they don't cause rotation for each other because they just don't have enough energy. This is um, most easily demonstrated. Quantum mechanics is mostly easily demonstrated using a valve. We don't have any of those because they're old fashioned transistors. A valve is a piece of electronics that only allows current to flow in one direction. How does it do it? Well, it's got two metal plates. And we apply our DC or even AC to the two plates. That doesn't block AC yet. It doesn't allow current to only flow in one direction. Um, we need something else to do that. Sorry, it's not a transistor, it's a diode, but we can build a transistor using it. So we want to be able to allow current to flow in this direction. And the way that we do that is we heat up one of these plates because it turns out that the electrons in here, so if we make this one the negative one and this one the positive one, the electrons in this electrode have a certain energy. The energy of the electrons in the electrode is equal to the electrical energy that we put in because of our second law of thermodynamics. The energy of this system, this electrode, is equal to the energy that it's got which is the energy from the power supply, plus heat energy, plus whatever internal energy it already has. So if we start off with just the power supply, if we organize this gap so that it's wide enough that the electrons can't get out of the metal and go across the gap and go into the other metal, the actual difficult step is getting out of the metal, we can make it more difficult by moving the electrode away because it's the electric field that pulls it out 
and not just the one electrode. So if we apply enough electric field, we can rip the electrons out of here and send them here. Obviously, if our power supply is that powerful, it makes no difference which way around this is. But if we have a weak power supply and we heat up one of these electrodes, so typically one of them would be a light bulb filament, effectively, a heater. So it would have another contact to it. Oh, my, let's give it two other contacts to it. If we turn on the heater, then we've generated a diode. Electricity or electrons can only flow in depends on that only in one direction. But we've also generated a transistor because if we don't pass energy through this coil, through the heater, we don't get any current flow at all. Obviously there's a limit and that's the limit of the parameters of it. But that's the same with a diode. If we apply normal mains voltage to a tiny diode that you might find inside your computer, it just catches on fire and nothing useful happens. They have a rating and these valves also have a rating, but they rely on quantum mechanics. The electron can't, or this, um, this electrode can't give all of its energy to one electron to shoot it out. There is an amount of energy that's divided among these and no electron has enough energy on average to escape. And so if we're below that threshold, we get nothing. If we go above that threshold, it switches on. If we apply light, we can make it switch on as well. And the color of the light then also matters, which tells us something else about quantum mechanics. It tells us that light is also quantized. It comes as particles and that's weird. <laughs>